take comfort in the fact that God is sovereign over all the circumstances of your life and praise God in the darkness. Let God's word strengthen your heart. There should be a passion in our heart to tell everybody how they can come to know Jesus Christ. God's word, please, this morning, and open to the Gospel of Mark, open to the Gospel of Mark chapter 10, and we're going to be looking at verses 13 down to verse 27, and I want to read scripture with you, so will you stand for the reading of God's word this morning as I read this narrative with you? Mark chapter 10, verse 13, and they brought young children to him that he should touch them, and his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, and put his hands upon them, and blessed them. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him, And asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. And he answered and he said unto him, Master, all these I have observed from my youth. And then Jesus, beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and take up the cross and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. This is the word of God. May God give us ears to hear what he says. You may be seated. Let me pray with you all. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the clarity of it. So, Lord, I pray you'll help me to, uh, as I preach, to make the message in the gospel here so very clear to every hearing soul. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was a boy, my father taught me and my brothers how to fish. Well, actually, I should say he taught my three brothers how to fish. I'm not sure he ever really taught me I'm a little bit difficult in that area. My idea of going fishing is going to Long John Silver's for lunch. But I remember one day we were out on the Chesapeake Bay in the boat, and uh, we were fishing for the big rock fish that are there. And I was with my father and brothers, and I had my fishing line in the water, and all of a sudden a fish hit the line, and my rod bent down. It was obvious that this was a huge fish kind of a monster fish, and I could just picture in my mind, this is a trophy fish, and I can just, I already had in my mind visions of being on the front page of the newspaper for the biggest rockfish ever in the state of Maryland, caught by the poorest fisherman, perhaps, in the state of Maryland, and I fought with it. My brothers came over, and they were trying to help me land this fish, and then the, the terrible thing happened, and those of you the fish know that when the line just snaps and goes straight, you lost the fish. And I remember that's exactly what happened to me. My brothers chided me. They said, you're a terrible fisherman. How could you let this trophy fish get away? Well, when you read uh, Mark chapter 10, you kind of scratch your head and you're tempted to think that Jesus had a big fish here on the line and somehow uh, he lost him. What, What is really happening here? Is Jesus a poor fisher of men? How is it that this man that came to Jesus and said, Lord, what must I do to have eternal life? How is it that this man ended up walking away from Jesus, grieved, and not getting eternal life? Did Jesus lose a big fish on the line? Is, is that what's happening here? Look in chapter 10. Look down at verse number 17 again. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and knelt to him. And asked him, good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? 
This is what we call a hot prospect. We would think that winning a person like this to the Lord would be a piece of cake. And the average church, if a person like this walked down the aisle and, and, this, and asked us this question, we would just simply, you know, lead them into the sinner's prayer. This man would already be ready to sign the card, to do whatever. I mean, this would be kind of an easy uh, thing here to do. He was also a choice prospect. The Bible tells us in other accounts, the same story in other accounts, like in the account of Luke, he says that he was a ruler. This was a man who was a, a position of authority, perhaps even a religious leader. It also says in Luke chapter 18, verse 23, that he was extremely rich. So someone like this getting saved, this would be a trophy catch. I mean, after he got saved, he could give his testimony of what God had done in his life. One man wrote this about this rich young ruler. He said, with just a tithe, he could bankroll Jesus' mission for years to come. What a catch this would be for the kingdom of God. He was a key person. And not only that, uh, he, he came from kind of a religious background. He didn't have any serious problem to overcome. Uh, he, no drugs, no alcohol, no history of trouble with the law. And from a boy, he says he's tried to keep the commandments. But with all that said, Jesus doesn't win him. In the end, this man walks away with sorrow. And when you read the story, you kind of scratch your head and you say, how could Jesus let a man like this get away? How could he let him get away? And in fact, when the, the man said what he said, Jesus responded by telling him, you have to keep the commandments. Now, in seminary, when I learned evangelism, and actually I learned evangelism here at Grace before I ever went to seminary, and we were taught the Romans Road and how to lead a person to Christ, we were never taught to say to a person, you have to keep the commandments to go to heaven. Because we know that you can't do that. It's impossible for someone to keep the commandments and get saved that way. But here's Jesus, and he tells him, you know, you, you, you must keep the commandments. And uh, we would say to Jesus, Jesus, you need to take our Romans Road soul winning class, and we need to teach you about evangelism here to help you out on this. But perhaps there's another possibility. Perhaps Jesus didn't let a big fish get away. Just maybe Jesus didn't blow it here. Maybe he is a skilled fisherman, and maybe Jesus is teaching us something about evangelism and about how to share the gospel. After all, he is perfect. He is the perfect teacher, and he knows the hearts of all men. Maybe we should examine our own heart before this story here. Maybe we should examine our own method of evangelism before what Jesus is doing right here. You know, modern evangelism is preoccupied with decisions and statistics and aisle walking and gimmicks and prefabricated presentations and emotional manipulation and so on. We have all these things almost down to a science on how we can get people to move and that sort of thing. And yet, I'm afraid that the church in America is filled with people who don't really understand the gospel and who don't really know the Lord Jesus Christ. I think a key statement in this whole narrative is found in verse number 21 when Jesus says, when Jesus beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, one thing thou lackest. There's something that is lacking here in your life. What's missing? What is it that's lacking for him? What is it that's lacking for you? It may be the very same thing that you're lacking with reference to your eternal salvation. So I want us to look at this story a little bit closer, and I want us to look at it under three headings. First of all, I want to think about with you the eager prospect. Let's take a closer look at this man. And, and when we look at this man, you know, there's a lot of things about him that we could say is right. I think we could say that he had the right attitude. The Bible says he came running to Jesus. In Matthew's account, it adds the word behold, kind of a dramatic event. Matthew was actually astonished that this man would come out of the crowd and run to Jesus and uh, the fact that he's running, that he's eager to get to Jesus. I don't find too many people eager nowadays to come to church and learn about eternal life. But this man is eager, and he has the right reverence. It tells us in verse 17 that he knelt before Jesus, and he calls him good master. And so he's showing the proper reverence and respect. 
Sometimes people don't show the proper respect to the house of God or the word of God when it's being taught or even the servant of God. This man was very reverent. He was very respectful. And really, it was in the the light of day when Jesus was on his journey to Jerusalem. This man runs through the crowd. He kind of pushes through the crowd. He doesn't really care what other people think. He comes to Jesus and he kneels before him. You might remember this, <clears throat> this story of Nicodemus where that he came to Jesus by night. And why did Nicodemus come by night? Because he didn't want his peers to see him coming to Jesus and asking questions. But here is this man, and he's running to Jesus in the middle of the day, and he kneels before him, a, a, a gesture of great humility. Perhaps the people that were in that crowd knew this man, knew him to be a religious man, and here he is, he kneels before Jesus. And we could just see in this story there's a restlessness in his soul. There is the absence of this assurance in his heart that he has eternal life. Is that your condition this morning? Is there a restlessness in your heart? He knew that there was something missing. He was religious, and yet he was lost. He knew that he lacked something, and he wanted to get this fixed. Uh, And he came at the right time. The Bible tells us in Matthew's account, it calls him a young man. Let me tell you, the time to come to Jesus is when you're young. Now, God will take you at any time, but I tell you, the best time is to come when you're young. The word for young here can mean anywhere between 20 and 28. Uh, So he's a relatively young man. The Bible says, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. One preacher said, don't blow the candle of or don't burn the candle of your life for the devil and then blow the smoke of a wasted life in the face of God give yourself to God while you're young he comes at the right time and he came to the right person he came to Jesus with this important thing about eternal life you have to give him credit for this you have to give him credit for understanding that Jesus understood salvation that he was the source of eternal life the Bible says this in 1 John 5, 11, this is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. The Bible says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus is the way to eternal life. There's not salvation in Buddha. There's no salvation in Allah. There's no salvation in Confucius. Jesus is the way. You say, well, you're awful narrow-minded. Yes, I'm following in the, the example that Jesus gave. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father except through me. And he asked the right question. We see this in verse 17 where he says, what shall I do that I may have eternal life or inherit eternal life? Now, I want to tell you, beloved, this is the most important question that you, that you could ever ask, the question of eternal life. How do you know? How can you know that you can have eternal life? This is the most important issue for you. This is the most important issue for your children, for your family. This is an area where you cannot afford to be wrong. Many people think that they're saved, but they're not. The Bible says, many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, haven't I prophesied, haven't I done all these things? And Jesus will say, depart from me, I never knew you. There are many people who are religious, but really they are lost. And so this is the most important issue that you'll ever face. Now, some people say, well, he was mistaken in asking, what good thing shall I do? But the Bible yet, we know that it's not works that you're saved, but the Bible does say this, that this is the work of God, that you believe on him that sent me. That is what we must do. We must believe. I want you to see the second thing. We see the eager prospect, but secondly, I want you to notice the evangelistic proposal. And this is where the story takes a surprising turn, because in answer to the young man's question, you would have thought that Jesus would have said, just believe, uh, just repent of your sin and believe on me, and you'll have eternal life. But that's not what happens here. Jesus didn't take the man at face value. He went deeper to reveal the man's heart. There were certain things that this man just did not understand, that he didn't grasp. And so therefore, since he didn't understand these things, he wasn't ready to believe. He wasn't ready to repent. 
what was it that he didn't understand? Well, first of all, he didn't, he didn't understand the goodness of God. Because look how Jesus responds. Look at verse 18. Then Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. Jesus answers his question with a more powerful question. Why do you call me good? There's no one good but God. Now, immediately, liberal critics will jump on this, and they'll say, well, you know, Jesus was denying his own deity here. That's not what's going on. You miss the entire point of the passage. Jesus' answer is not designed to designate who he is or reveal who he is. The question is designed to show this man that he doesn't understand what real goodness is. He has a wrong idea of goodness. You see, that's the problem with people today. They don't really understand goodness. And when you talk about their salvation, they'll say something like this. Well, you know, if you ask them, you know, do you know that you're going to go to heaven when you die? And they, they basically say, well, you know, I'm basically a good person. I, I'm, I'm good. I don't really do the bad things like I see people on the news. You know, I, I hear of these other things that people do. You know, when we judge ourselves as being good, you know what we normally do? We normally compare ourselves to somebody else that's worse than us. And that makes us feel a whole lot better. Well, I might not be perfect, but I'll tell you, I'm not like this person over here. And so compared to, to that person, I'm, I'm pretty good. And I do good things. And that's what people are trusting in for salvation. I read a, a Reader's Digest interview where they interviewed a very famous athlete, and they were asking him about this one question, and he said this, one day we're all going to die and God is going to judge us, our good deeds and our bad deeds. If our bad outweighs the good, you'll go to heaven, he said. And then he said, if the good outweighs the bad, um, or excuse me, if your bad deeds outweigh your good deeds, you'll go to hell. Let me get that right. And if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, you go to heaven. And this man went on to say, with everything I do, I ask myself, will God accept this? One day you will wake up and it will be judgment day, so you need to do good deeds. And then he went on to list all the good things that he had done. And this is how this rich young ruler thought about goodness. And this is, quite frankly, what the majority of people think about goodness. They have their own uh, standard of what goodness is. And they measure themselves according to that standard. But the problem is, is that true goodness is not defined by what you think goodness is. True goodness is defined by the character of God. God is the one who defines true goodness. And that goodness, that standard of goodness is found in the law of God. And if you want to go the route of goodness to heaven, then you have to follow God's standard. And what God demands is absolute goodness total perfection. Absolute total perfection. This man had placed faith in his own goodness, and that's why there was restlessness in him. He misunderstood goodness, but also he didn't understand the sinfulness of man, because look at verse 19. Notice what Jesus says. He says, thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and thy mother. In verse 20, and he answered and he said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. I've done all these. Jesus tells him, look, here are the commandments. Obey these commandments. And Jesus goes through some of them just to let him know what these commandments are. It's obviously, this is referring to the Ten Commandments. And he's actually saying, you need to measure yourself next to God's standards, not your own standard. When a little boy came to his mother one day little five-year-old boy, and he said, Mom, I am 10 feet tall. And she said, Jimmy, you're not 10 feet tall. He said, yes, I am. She said, you're not. Stop saying that. He said, I can prove it. And he pulled out a ruler, a ruler that he had made with his own standard of measurement. And according to the ruler that he had made, he was 10 feet tall. The only problem is you don't get to make your own standard when it comes to religion. You don't get to make your own standard of what goodness is. And that's the problem with people today. They have their own measure. They have their own standard. 
and they measure themselves with that standard. And this is what this rich young ruler was doing. And what Jesus does here in this passage is he takes the ruler of this rich young ruler and he breaks it, he snaps it in half, he smashes it. And then he slams this man down next to God's ruler, God's standard for this man to measure himself. But just to show you how utterly blind this man is spiritually, in response to the commandments, this, this young man says, look, Master, I've observed all this from my youth. I mean, this man utterly lacked a sense of his own sinfulness. I would tell you, friend, that no one has obeyed all the commandments from their youth. No one has done that. This man obviously didn't hear Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. When Jesus said the righteousness that God is looking for is not just an outward conformity to some standard, but also it's inward as well. It's not enough that you didn't commit adultery. If you have lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. It's not enough that you don't murder someone, but if you have hatred or anger in your heart towards someone, that constitutes murder in the eyes of God. The righteousness that God talks about, no one can measure up to that. And so... This, this man is blind about his own sinfulness. J.C. Ryle wrote this, An answer more full of darkness and self-ignorance is impossible to conceive. He who made it could have, only, could have known nothing rightly, either about himself or God or God's law. And so what are we seeing here about this man? He was filled with religious pride. He didn't understand that he was a sinner in desperate need of the mercy of God for eternal life. You know, I think part of the problem we have in evangelism today is we fail to confront people about their sinfulness before a holy God. And I want to tell you something, friend. The gospel starts with the holiness of God, that he is a holy God, and he demands holiness, and none of us have it. We've all broken his law. We're all sinners and until we realize how sinful we are, we're not ready to go into the kingdom. We're not ready to be saved. A person has to be measured next to the perfect law of God so they, they can see their own sinfulness and deficiency, and therefore they can run to God for mercy. They can run to God for forgiveness. That's why in the book of Romans, the apostle Paul when he talks about the gospel, he spends the first three chapters talking about the sinfulness of man before he ever talks about the mercy and the love of God. You know why? Because if a person is not convinced of their own sinfulness before a holy God, they'll never turn to him for mercy. They'll want to strut into the kingdom thinking that their own righteousness, their own goodness is enough for them when it's not. That's why the Bible says in Galatians 3.24 that the law is a tutor that leads us to Christ, that shows us our need, that breaks up the soil of self-righteousness in our own heart before the seed of the gospel can be planted and watered by the tears of sinners mourning over their sin. I remember uh, years ago, when I was pastoring down south, there was a, a lady who received a Bible from one of our men in our church. She was going out, and uh, this lady had a, her own business <clears throat> in downtown Memphis. The name of her store was My Three Habits because she sold cigarettes and lottery tickets and alcohol. And that was the name of her store. And this man went by, and he put a Bible there for her to read, and for a few weeks, she just ignored it. And finally, one day, when business was slow, she picked up that Bible and she began to read. And she was fascinated by the story of Christ. And her heart began to break over her own sin. And she un understood that she was a sinner and she understood that Jesus was sinless. And as she read the gospel, she understood that Jesus died on the cross for her sin. She understood that there was nothing that she could do to be saved other than put her faith in Christ. This is with no one witnessing to her. She read all this in the Bible. She put all this together. She came into my office, and she was crying. She was broken with tears over what she had read in the gospel. She was mourning 
over her sin. And she said, she said, you know, I, I want to know, I want to know that I'm saved. I want to, I want to be a Christian. And I'll be honest with you, there was nothing left for me to do. She had already made that decision. She was already trusting in Christ alone. She was already mourning. Remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are they that are, or blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. There was nothing left for me to do here. And she, I remember the question she asked. She said, when do you stop mourning and crying over your sin? And I said, well, really, as a believer, you never really stop mourning over your sin. There's always a sense in which we constantly mourn. But on the other hand, paradoxically, we are also filled with comfort at the same time. We're also filled with joy because we know that God has forgiven us and that we are now his children. And so while we continue to mourn over our sinfulness, we are also comforted to know that God has accepted us because of our repentance, because we have put our faith in what Jesus has done for us. Here is this man. He's religiously proud. He's supremely confident about what he has done. He doesn't understand the holiness or goodness of God. He doesn't understand the sinfulness of man. But I'll tell you another thing he doesn't understand. He doesn't understand the deceitfulness of riches. Notice how Jesus responds to him in verse 21. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest. Go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and take up the cross and follow me. And Jesus basically says, look, and by the way, I love where it says, uh, where he looked at him, he loved him. And what does that mean? Jesus felt love for him. Jesus knew this man was honestly seeking, but he was, he was self-righteous. He was deceived. And I think that he loved this man because he felt for this man because he knew that he wasn't ready. And, and he had a genuine love and a compassion for this man. And so Jesus, again, just to, to help this man see himself as he really was, Jesus gives him the ultimate test to show whether or not he really is ready. And he says in verse 21, then, okay, then this should be easy for you. This is what you lack. Go your way, sell all that you have, give it to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. Pick up your cross and follow me. I mean, if you've obeyed all the commandments, this shouldn't be really hard. For you We're to glad it. you've joined us today for this broadcast of The Ever-Living Story, a media outreach of Grace Bible Baptist Church in Catonsville, Maryland. It's our sincere prayer that this broadcast has touched the spiritual needs of your heart. The Lord Jesus Christ has come into this world to change our lives, to bring us eternal life. And Grace is a local congregation where the Word of God is very clearly preached, as you've just seen. We're located just off exit 17 of the Baltimore Beltway at 1518 North Rolling Road, Catonsville, Maryland. Let me leave you with this thought. Remember, the Lord Jesus Christ has changed your life, and He wants you to live out every day of it for His ever-living story.